Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Racing Weekly, a podcast and YouTube show brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. A lot to look forward to this weekend. Of course, there's good racing in Britain, the Sprint Cup at Haydock and Irish Champions Weekend uh, as well to look forward to. Lots of good racing to look back on. And I'm delighted that Sam Turner is going to be able to do both, look back and look forward with me. And plus, talk about one or two subjects, Sam, that continue to hang over the sport of horse racing like the Sword of Damocles. But we'll get to that later on. I haven't seen you for a bit. How have you been? Yeah, good form. Thanks, Rish. Uh, enjoying the decent weather, which is a, a welcome bonus. Nice bit of Indian summer. Um, shame there's no test cricket to watch, but uh, we we'll make do with the T20s. And we won't talk about football this morning. We are definitely going to talk, not talking about football. Uh, we're going to talk about football with about five or six, three minutes left of normal time. And then after that, we not <laughs> Very good. Um, just a brief word about the, the season that we've had. You and I obviously concentrated quite a bit on, on York, but we haven't had a chance to talk much about that on, on the racing uh, weekly podcast. Um, it's still relevant to, to reflect on that, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think it was a really good meeting. Really enjoyed it. Um, the weather held firm most of the time. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was all good stuff, wasn't it? Well, why don't we start with that in our racing recap. And, of course, the first feature of the uh, international meeting at York or the, uh, the Evo meeting at York was the international. And Mosterdaff lowered the colours of Paddington Sam, the first horse to do that this season. Um, I was blown away by the way Frankie Dettori dictated tactics on him. I thought it was a brilliant ride, but he's done that quite a lot through his career and indeed this season. What was your take? Yeah, another tremendous riding performance, wasn't it? And, you know, that's been the narrative of the year, really. Uh, I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever sort of, well, we don't know whether he's actually retired from the sport yet, but I don't know if anybody's actually had a closing period of their career which has been quite as astonishing and and groundbreaking as, as frankie has in this last year that the raft of big races that he's managed to pocket um riding all sorts of different races we saw that on on, on offer at york obviously with absurd that you know the way that he won the ebor there uh Mostadaf from the front um i mean he's just he's just rewritten the the, the record-breaking history books at the moment and just the way that he's riding compared to you know you just kick back 12 months and the Royal Ascot, the penultimate Royal Ascot of his career, when everyone was questioning why he was riding, uh, and now is everyone, why is he retiring? Yeah, it's a very fair question that people keep asking, you know, when you're riding or when you're performing so well at something you do uh, for a living, why, why stop because of age or why stop because it's the thing to do? Yeah, is he riding like that because he's free of the shackles or is he riding like he is just because he's a magnificent rider and, you know, one of the top riders that we've seen, well, certainly in my lifetime, um, and I've been privileged to see under both codes some absolutely world-breaking riders, um, but he he is right up there. Tactically very astute, obviously got brilliant hands, settle horses superbly, strong when he needs to be, you know, well into his 50s now, he won't thank me for saying that, I said well into them, into his 50s now, and to be competing at top level sports at that age, with that hunger and that ambition, and that determination, um, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, lots of people have sort of held on and, and, and done well in their latter stages of their career. Um, you know, look at Jimmy Anderson, for instance, you know, probably bowled better than his figures would suggest through the ashes through this summer. Um, you know, but Frankie's got 10 years on him. <laughs> I know that he's not having to trundle in and hit the crease and bowl 85 miles an hour for 20 overs and 25 overs a day. But, you know, it's still a grind. He's still up training every morning, keeping himself as physically fit as he possibly can be. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's just astonishing to see him. Yeah, I guess the, the the phrase that it's better to go when they want you to stay is probably more apt than when they want you to go. So, something. yeah, I think I think that's a, a really good adage. You know, go when they're questioning why you're going rather than when are you going. Um, you know, and I, I think that has it has freed him up this year, and I think that's why you know we see we say all the time, don't we, that you know in riding and training and all these different you know, top level sports confidence is just that extra one or two percent in a race. Things just happen for you. And certainly things have really always just happened for Frankie, really, in the latter stages of his career. You know, he's he's got the he's got the best of most of those narrow margin victories. Um, 
you know, by definition, their victories. But you know what I mean? That the real tight calls, Frankie just seems to get that extract that extra little bit of um I don't know, strength and determination from a horse just through the way that he rides. And I think that's that's sort of you know providing him with a with a fantastic closing year of his career. And you know, if he is to go out, then I think that's you know, it's a magnificent way of going out, isn't it? Yeah, he had a brilliant meeting at York. Um, as for the winner of the race, Sam, Mostadam, mm. I mean, he comes from arguably one of the best bits of uh, form from the season. Equinox beating Mostadam, mm. Zagray, and, of course, Westover. Um, yeah. A classic. I mean, that race has worked out well. And, and Mostadam has established himself now as arguably uh, the leading 10 furlong horse uh, on, on turf. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about it a little bit as well. And, and you know, Shabwell really should be congratulated and, and sort of heartily patted on the back for the way that they've campaigned their older horses and, and the, the stables that have trained for them. Obviously, Owen Burroughs, John Gosden, you know, Charlie Hills have all enjoyed, you know, massive success really in the last five, six years in these colours. And obviously, Shabwell's legacy stretches a long way back. But They've made some pretty robust and um, clinical decisions about cutting back their, 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 you know, training empire as such, um, and that's worked out pretty well in the main because they've still been very, very competitive in some of the le- seasons leading, certainly middle distance races uh, for sure, and they've enjoyed incredible success really. And this is with their older horses, you know, like to Hookham, Al Flaylers coming through the ranks now. Mostadaf is finally realising that potential. You know, there's a raft of them, and they've done they've done brilliantly well. They've, they've, it's hard to say for a, a a group or an operation as big as Shadwell that they're punching above their weight, but numbers wise, they probably are. They're winning sort of more high quality races than perhaps their numbers in training should suggest. Well, it, it seems to be the the for, formula for success for them because it's going very well. The runner up Paddington looks like he might be heading to the QE2 on Champions Day at Ascot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mostadaf heading possibly to the champion stakes assuming that the ground is, is quick enough mm. um so that's a look at the judmont international what about the nunthorpe sam mm. probably one of the stories of the season tell me about it tell me what was your view on living the dream winning for adam west i think it was jaw dropping wasn't it really i mean look if any if any track is really set up for a little bit of a surprise like that then it's possibly york where it, it, it favours pace, it favours the front runners so those sprint trips, you can get off and away, get a rhythm and that's what Living the Dream certainly did under a beautifully executed ride from Sean Curran. Um, just a really heartwarming story really, um, obviously Adam West is a, is a smaller trainer that wouldn't be on the radar of a lot of casual watchers of racing. Th- those who've you know, followed flat racing closely will know that he, he does sort of punch above his weight and none more so than on the Naismar on that Friday afternoon. Um, just a quite extraordinary performance, you know, it brought a, a tear to almost a glass eye, didn't it, really? The way that, uh, you know, the emotion of the of the occasion afterwards. Uh, and I don't think you could help but be moved by the sort of the shock and awe of the trainer and the connections and, and the celebrations afterwards, just what the flat racing season really needed. And, you know, yeah, commiserations to, to John Quinn and Sean Quinn and the team there with, with um, Highfield Princess, but they've got opportunities this weekend to grab a grub, uh, group one. This was very much live in the moment and, you know, hopefully Adam West is still doing so. Indeed. Um, and a massive moment for the training centre of Epsom, obviously. Yes. Um, so it was particularly uh, inspiring. First Group 1 winner for Epsom since Harbour Law won the, the ledger, what was it, seven years ago? Um, and, you know, Adam West has only got 40 horses or so. It's it's mm. big in terms. Um but for Epsom, hopefully, it's another uh, little bit of inspiration for people to realise that, you know, Epsom, you can train big winners. Yeah. Anyway. You can train big winners anyway. Yeah, I mean, Jim Boyle's, you know, done exceptionally well there in, in recent years. And he's putting a lot of money into, you know, rebuilding his yard. Um, Adam's yard is seem to, seemingly growing well. You know, and there's some old stalwarts that, that still train sort of out of Epsom as well. So, it's not too far from you, Rish, is it? And, you know, oh. it's a place that's very dear to your heart and it'd be great to see it re-emerge as a training centre. Yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly echo those sentiments. Um, yes, living the dream looks like um, may have one run in America before the Breeders' Cup. It could be Keeneland, but the Breeders' Cup is the plan. And, of course, it's a win in your in race, so all expenses paid. Uh, mm. 
team, which was which was one of the, the barriers when they had thought about potentially going to the Breeders' Cup earlier in the season. So exciting times uh, for Adam West, the owners of uh, Living the Dream, and Sean Curran as well, uh, a first group yeah. one with him. I thought, I thought he spoke brilliantly afterwards, Rich. You know, he composed himself extremely well, and I thought he did himself, you know, the world of good. You know, you've got an opportunity there to sort of showcase your talents both on the track and, and in the saddle afterwards when you have a microphone thrust under your nose. And I, I thought he conducted himself brilliantly and I thought it was a really good post-race interview from him. Yeah, um, he uh, he certainly uh, advertised both uh, what he can do in the saddle and out of it uh, with that success uh, in the Nunthorpe. Um, just anything else from, obviously there were a number of meritorious performances, Sam, at uh, the Ebor meeting. Was there anything else that, that really stood out for you? I've got one that I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that in the last week or so it's developed. Um, so I'll, I'll come to that, but I'll let you kick off here. But did you have any maximum bets cop at York? I didn't have a maximum bet up at York, but it's possible that I might be heading to um, a significant bet uh, from oh. a horse run at York due okay. to run the next couple of um, weeks. Well, I, unfortunately, my selection didn't make the field for the long sale, but you know, I was really pleased to see Coltrane finally gain you know, the success that his, his efforts probably deserved. He was, you know, agonisingly beaten in the Gold Cup at Ascot and, you know, he's run creditably ever since. And I, I thought it was great that, you know, he actually got his head in front. He, he certainly warranted winning a nice prize like that. And I thought that was a really good performance from him. Very solid horse at that level, isn't he? He always gives his best and he's been tremendously consistent since ever, ever since. I think it was the Ascot stakes he won back in the day and um, he's, he's sort of, rarely runs a bad race so I, I, I'm pleased to see him finally get the gold medal. Yeah he, he he's a horse who has been uh, campaigning at the high, a high level I mean he's progressed really well in the last couple of seasons but he's now been at the mm. high level a long time and he deserved that moment uh, in the in the Lonsdale. Um, obviously Frank Vittori had a great finish to the meeting winning with Absurd and, and Ken Ross on the final day but I'm just concentrating for a brief moment Sam on the comparison between Absurd winning the Ebor and the horse that really struck me most at the whole meeting uh, for the future, and that was Middle Earth winning the Melrose on mm. the same same distance. A three-year-old, um, really, according to weights and age, he should have finished a significant way um, behind Absurd according to the times, but he was only about a length behind mm. the two of them. And some of the splits he clocked in that last six furlongs of the race that were fantastic showed that he's got a bit of speed as well, but obviously he stays quite well. Um, and it wasn't a surprise uh, last week when Connections confirmed that they're going to supplement him for the St. Ledger. Now, I know there are a number of good horses already pointing to the Ledger. In fact, the, the Gosden team, Middle Earth trained by John and Thady Gosden, have already got Arrest and Gregory. So it's possible that they might think that they've got two better shots at the title mm. than Middle Earth. But I was blown away by what he did. And he's only had four runs so far. Mm. Uh, I love the way he made up his ground. He may have been slightly advantaged racing on the stand side in the closing stages, but I don't think it would have mattered where he raced. Uh, he and Denmark pulled well clear. He beat Denmark comfortably, and Denmark beat everything else in what looked to be a competitive Melrose comfortably. And so as a consequence, I'm very keen on Middle Earth for the ledger. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't dissuade you. Um, I mean, you look at the roll call of horses that have won the race in recent times. You know, Solcombe obviously is doing very decent things down in Australia now. Coltrane 2020. Hamish 2019, you know, yeah. it, it is a really, really good stepping stone for a high class stayer um, and horses that go that route. So, yeah, why not? I, I think the long straight will certainly suit him at Doncaster. He's got speed. Um, I don't think they quite know what, what they had going into the race, to be honest. I, I, just listening to John Gosden afterwards, he, he wasn't absolutely dogmatic that the ledger would be the way he'd go. Um, but obviously they've warmed to that idea a little bit and it makes perfect sense. Yeah, he, he seems to me, Middle Earth, that he could be a sort of mile and a half, mile and six horse, as opposed mm -hmm. to sometimes you think the ledger, you think a mile and six plus, whereas I think he might be one of the speedier ledger types. So um, excited about him. Um, that was obviously your, that's now comfortably in the past, Sam. Um, <laughs> more recently, there was some good racing at Sandan on the weekend. I had the uh, privilege mm -hmm. of pleasure to be there. Um, and amongst the winners, impressive winners, um, Heredia won the Atalanta Stakes. Uh, I thought last year, and I don't know what you think, Sam, I thought last year she was heading in the direction of potentially being a top, top-class filly. Uh, mm. 
seven furlongs a mile, and then it all went a bit stale. This season, though, much better. Yeah, I, I just I, I love this ride. I thought it was an awkward draw. I thought Sean Levy did really well to get some cover on her. Um, and I just thought it was an absolute archetypal Sandam ride, really, smuggler into the race and then produce her with that turn of foot that we know she possesses. I thought it was a really tidy performance. Um, I thought it was quite, you know, the way that the race panned out, it was run at a, a genuine gallop, so it did give her something to shoot at. But I, I didn't think it was an easy task from where she was and on the track, um, and, you know, under any any. Um, opportunity for her to then go and quicken up as the, the way she did. I think Sean decided to stick clear of all that schmozzle on the inside, which can often be the, the failing of, of jockeys at Sandown and thought she got a beautiful ride and it's onwards and upwards for her. Um, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be surprised to see her in the States at some stage, I think. Yeah, they're talking about the Breeders' Cup, certainly at the end of the season, options over a mile and a mile and a quarter. She could go for the mile or she could go for the Philly Mare Tour. Um, I think uh, she may have a go at the Sun Chariot before that, which mm. probably, I mean, she deserves a crack at a high level. The mm. last two, the Haydock and the Sandown, they've been mightily impressive. And that's the filly that I thought we would have seen at the end of last season. For whatever reason, it didn't go well. But speaking to Richard Hannon after the race, he said that for whatever reason, she's thriving. He said that's down to the trainer. Obviously, if she's not thri thriving, it's down to the jockey. Um, <laughs> But he's very, very excited about what she might be doing now because he said she just has blossomed at home and that's obviously emulating itself on the racetrack. So already uh, definitely exciting for the rest of the season. But worth mm. just bearing in mind, though, Coppice, who was well fancied for that race, uh, at the time I thought she was very disappointing and looked a bit awkward. But as it is su su subsequently emerged that the saddle uh, slipped, there was an issue with Tat. I didn't know that at the time. So I wouldn't completely write her off. She's a... No. To, to Calix, um, so uh, give her another chance. Um, mm. Dual identity, Sam. A horse who's been campaigned in and around some of the, <laughs> the toughest handicaps over the last couple of seasons. Got another moment at Sandy. He obviously likes Sandown. He won over C and D again on the weekend. Yeah, those races seem to set up quite well for him around there. Um, I think I put him up in the Cambridge last year, and he ran really well. Very solid effort from him. You know, around nine, ten furlongs, good ground. You know, he finds himself. A race or two when the setup suits it and I think whatever happens at Sandown when those big field handicaps it, it just seems to play to his strength but you know the way that he bounded clear I know a lot of people are saying well he's going to be reassessed and that might be his Cambridgeshire chance gone but he just seems in great heart at the moment and whatever reason seems to come right at this this back end of the year as well so um, good for him that he managed to, to get his head in front a welcome winner for, for William Knight as well and he's obviously striking up a good relationship with Marco Gianni yeah, welcome winner for William Knight, most certainly, and definitely dual identity. Uh, William Knight saying that Cambridgeshire is indeed the plan. So, um, mm -hmm. forward to seeing how he gets on, maybe uh, at least as good, if not better, than he did last year. Now, you say welcome winner. What about Charlie Appleby? Now, the stable's still been operating in terms of strike rate very well. They've mm -hmm. had a very good season that, but no stars. Um, and that's what they really want. Charlie Appleby's yeah. high two year olds would be the. The, the, the fountain of hope for them. A um, couple have emerged, Arabian Crown perhaps, and then on Saturday, mm. the Solario, uh, Ablan continued uh, his progression. He's won, He's now two from two. He won the Solario. But what did you make of the race itself in terms of a form guide? I'd, I'd be very wary of it as a, as a form guide. I, I still really like the performance of the winner. Um, still thought he was very green, learning on the job. Um, as we could all see, really, you know, shifted around a little bit, took a while to engage top gear. But that's twice now he's won in close finishes, twice that he's hit the line fairly strong, uh, which is encouraging. He looks like he got a mile standing on his head. Um, so that, that you know, augurs well for, for going forward um, for the back end of the season. You're right. I think the Appleby team do need one or two stars from their two year olds. It, it will salvage what's been. I would say an underwhelming season. I don't think that's been unfair. The older horses, the three-year-olds, just haven't been up to scratch. And I think, you know, that's probably why Charlie didn't have a runner at, at Goodwood. You know, the, he's fully aware of what he has and there's no point just firing bullets for the sake of it. You might as well just run horses with good chances. And that's probably why the strike rate has, has stood up fairly well. There are one or two youngsters coming through now, certainly on the Colt side, as you say, Ablan, Arabian Crown, by the book. Once race, Son of Franklin managed to win. Ancient Wisdom. You know, there are a few there that hopefully they can plot 
you know, nice, nice races for them at the back end and provide some competition for Bally Doyle, who seems to just who seem to just have a raft of brilliant two year old talent, um, both sexes. So I think it's important for the back end of the year. We've, you know, there's some very important two year old races on the horizon and, and hopefully Charlie can be competitive in those. I agree. Uh, shall I land at 101 for uh, Racing Weekly regular listeners, viewers, etc. from the Solaria? Uh, Stout horse, the one to follow. Is that what you're going to say? What a good run that was, I thought, from Star yeah. Horse. I thought it was a terrific run. Now, I'm not saying he's a, he's a potential group one horse or anything, but he's certainly better than he showed in the Solario. Um, quickened up so nicely on the outside. I thought he was going to go and win the race, but it was a messy race. Hmm. And he still looks, he still looks a massive work in progress. Green, um, not entirely straightforward, um, but he's got lots of speed, lots of ability, and I like the way he picked up. Just ran out of juice. Yeah, I, yeah. Again, I mean, it, it's not turning into the Shaw Levy show, but I, th- I thought he rode a brilliant, brilliant race on the the runner-up in his fall, and you know, set very modest tempo, and you know, came within a neck of pulling it off. Um, another good run from a Brian Mee and Juvenal as well in recent mm-hmm. times. Um, yeah, and, and Starlo, the way that the race panned out and, and worked out, probably had a lot on, didn't he? Having to come from where he did, had to quicken. Um, if he'd been a really good horse and, and, and a complete horse at this stage of his career, he might have seen it out better. But as you say, he's probably just got a leg in each county at the moment, um, just needs a winter. And you'd imagine that he's going to be more the finished article next year. And similar comments apply to David Manuzio's runner, Devil's mm. Point. He is the Sam Turner of the paddock. I mean, he was a very <laughs> individual. What, Gray and Lane? Um, well, he had a few white bits on him. And <laughs> he was quite attractive. So, yes, he was like you. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gray and he, Lane. He, he's, a, he's a really gorgeous individual. And, and I, I'm, again, you watch his finishing effort where he gets outpaced and actually he just drinks a little bit to the left. But once straightened out, he picked up really well. Um, and I think the race is going to work out well in the long run. I think it might be a decent um, decent renewal of the Solario. I'm not sure it's going to play out how it did in that race, yeah. given how, what Sean Levy did. But I think good horses have taken part in it. Yeah, there's certainly there's a difference in saying, well, will the race work out as a form, from a form perspective? Maybe not, because you could see any one of the first three or four under different circumstances reversing the placings. But... Is it, is it race? And you were lucky enough to be there and see them all firsthand that you think you'd want to be positive about, even though the time was pretty modest. Um, and, and yes, it was. You know, there, there was there was plenty of potential going into the race. We saw a horse manage to retain his unbeaten record, you know, a well-bred Dubawi um, from a top stable. And the horses that finished in and around both sh- showed promise, all showed promise, sorry, in different ways, um, particularly the third and fourth. So, yeah, I think it's a race still to be positive about, but... You know, I wouldn't be dogmatic that if the cards were dealt again, that would be how the race finished. Yeah, that's a better summary. That's why you're a journalist. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> um, on the subject of Charlie Appleby, obviously that was good for the team with Ablan winning the Solario, but real disappointment with military mm. order at uh, at Chester. That was very disappointing. He looked to be going fine, turning for home, but mm. found very little. Shanro winning for Carl Thornton, um, massive day for them. Um, but where are we left with military order, one-time favourite for the derby, sir? Yeah, I just, I don't know. I mean, he was strong enough in the market. There weren't really any any massive vibes that, look, he was going to need that first run back. Or, you know, they surely wouldn't have sent him to Chester if they felt that, you know, he wasn't at least 90, 95% there. Um, just a massive disappointment, really. There was one or two in the race. Lone Eagle obviously didn't run particularly well. And that's why it was left to a nine-year-old. Shan Rowe to, to come and win. And that's a brilliant piece of tracing, tra- placing and training from Carl Thornton, bouncing out of a Galway win um, and, and very cleverly identified a race there for Shan Rowe, who's not the easiest, apparently. He either travels with a Shetland pony um, or, or gets to a, a meeting early and just sort of goes out in the field and, and whatever. So they have to manage him a little bit, but he's very talented on his day. I thought it was a really smart ride as well from Jason Hart. But yeah, the overwhelming feeling after watching the race was of disappointment, really, that military order, a horse that promised so much, is is really struggling to to, to find that level uh, and reach that level of potential that he showed, you know, sort of in the spring. Yeah, particularly when you see what you know, why Piero did at Royal Ascot, etc. Mm. Disappointing that he's yeah. lost. Um, but 
it's not it's only one bad run after the derby you know and there was a mm. bit of gap between and it was over a mile six maybe um, we're being too hasty and there'll be another day for him perhaps this season and um, sticking to uh, Britain uh, Kurdos uh, winning up at uh, Beverly for Clive Cox mm. so uh, an honourable mention for his terrific sprinter for such a long time Tiz Marvellous who bowed out mm. uh, on the weekend yeah yeah brilliantly named horse and you know he he lit up Ascot a couple of times, didn't he, with really good performances there and um, went out in his shield here. He was beaten less than a length by his stable mate and I thought it was a really decent performance from him, really. Um, nice win from the, the winner as well. Um, I thought ben, ben Curtis, he found himself in a little bit of a pocket but didn't panic. The race opened up for him a bit late on. And I thought he won quite snugly, really, Curtis, in the, horse, in the style of a horse that's, that's going the right way. So... Um, yeah, it, it wasn't a vintage renewal, I didn't think, of the race, but it's still a nice performance and a, and a good performance by the three-year-old. Yeah, I, I found it amusing when Ben Curtis was obviously chatting about his win on Kurdos and then also paid tribute to Tiz Marvellous and blamed himself for one of his defeats in the <laughs> in, in, in years gone by. So Very uh, humble, very humble. Um, a, a brief word about what happened in France in the Pretty Moulin on the weekend. Big Rock, odds on favourite to win it, instead of a pretty good season, but without getting that real big prize uh, that he promised at the start of the season, he got turned over by the Philly Sautern. Yeah, there were no real excuses, were there? The only thing you could perhaps say was that, you know, Big Rock was over on that far rail and, and the main sort of challenges and the winner, you know, came a little bit wider, possibly, but, you know, it seemed to have the, the run of the race in the front. Um, I don't think the, the overall time or, or, or sectionals were that astonishing either, so um, there, there was no obvious excuse for Big Rock, really. In fact, Cheval backed up his performance in the Sussex with another solid run there. A bit disappointing. I, I think the overall view of the race was, you know, we've had all these really good mile races in quite a short space of time, haven't we? And, you know, it was disappointing perhaps that there was no British challenger in that, but I think we just run out of horses to run in it. So, um, you know, a, a very cute and savvy Bit of placing from the trainer of Sauterne and, and, you know, I thought she she did it quite nicely. She quickened and always looked like she was going to nail Big Rock, you know, inside the final furlong. Yeah, that was as straightforward as, as it was for, for Sauterne, as it was for Big Rock, you know, doing what he normally does out in front and then just getting picked mm -hmm. up by a horse who was better on the day. Um, anything else from the, the weekend or in the last week or so, Sam, that caught your eye? I mean, there was one Philly classical song who won for yeah. Ray Stand down. I'll, I'll throw her in the mix. She was very impressive. Um, yeah, I, I was taken with her because it just took her a little bit of time to find full stride. But when she hit the line very strong, didn't she? I thought she could develop into a nice miler for next year. Most oh. definitely. No, I'm, I'm with you there. I thought she she stepped up on that that first run. Yeah, he, he mentioned she might have one more run this season, and it, not entirely certain where that will be. Um, but judging by the way she's won, she's going to go up into Patton Company, most likely. And yeah. uh, she costs 475 grand or something like that. And uh, she's exciting, classical song. I don't think they're going to be messing about with her, put it that way. No. What a what a lovely turn of phrase. Um, has anybody else have used that phrase? They're not messing about. <laughs> they're not messing about. No, they're not messing about. Now, speaking of messing about. You love it, big fella. Sorry. I don't love what's going on with the affordability checks. It continues to hang over the sport of horse racing. As I said at the start of this week's podcast, um, it's becoming more of a concern. I mean, obviously, if you follow them, if you buy and, and read the Racing Post, you'll see that they're increasing their campaign for uh, at least bringing awareness to as many people as possible. And everybody's now chiming in. Um, but this has been hanging over the sport for some time. Um, what what is your opinion uh, on the way things stand? How how much of a danger do you feel the sport is under at the moment? How much of a threat are we under because of these checks? We're, we're under massive threat, Rich, from from a number of different angles, really, and 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 this is probably the the, the chief one. Um, I I find it all a bit exasperating, to be honest, and it's I will be a little bit careful because you know we are a bookmaker sponsored podcast. But I can't help feeling that the lack of regulation in the previous years, self-regulation, has come back to bite us in the proverbial. Um, 
unfortunately now we instead of being able to safeguard our own sport we're, we're in the hands of others and that's a bit of that's always going to be a bit of an issue and we're losing some big owners are going out of the game but owner punters who, who like to bet on their own horses and that that you know that isn't a crime that's that's happened since time in memoriam and once those people start going out of the game not only do you lose the, the revenue and the, the levy from from these people who turn over quite serious sums of money you also lose the horses and we can't afford to lose any horses i know they say that the horse population is is, is doing fairly well at the moment and there's still been big money spent at the at the sales but i think that's by a certain percentage of the owner base and and not you know people like yourself myself who who like a, a small share in a horse not extravagant horses by any stretch of the means you know working man's prices that you would pay um and if you can't get a bet on those sort of horses you're not just going to continue to fund the sport just at the goodness of your heart certain people can do that mm. certain billionaires can do that but but the man in the street who likes to share in a horse and who wants to have a bet on it they, they can't do it and that, that's just one sort of segment of the punting population which are just going to go out of the game if we're not careful and i speak to a lot of people you know sort of day in day out really about their betting I, personally i've never bet as as less as i do now um i'd, I'd say i turn over less money now i've never been an extraordinary high staked punter um but i i turn over less now primarily because it's it's such a faff and i do it as a recreational you know hopefully a way of making a few extra quid on the side like a lot of people do in the media you know we're not professionals we're, we're not even semi-professional we do it hopefully to to fund a couple of nice holidays a year or whatever you might you know what whatever your motivation is to do it um and when you you know you, you're you're trying to get 40 or 50 quid each way and you're getting knocked back to 12 50 each way talking about knockbacks is extremely boring everybody has them but it's these, these issues are going to impact on the levy long term stretching forward. And unfortunately, the affordability checks are just another hurdle and a rather seismic hurdle that, that punters, just normal, general, run of the mill, Saturday, midweek recreational punters are going to have to hurdle as well. And unfortunately, this is where we are with it, the sport at the moment. And the levy is obviously going to decrease. That's going to affect prize money. And we're going to have a smaller piece of the cake for prize money which is essentially why there is now a talent train going to australia and and various other countries around the world all our best horses are being sold because there is no prize money here for them to to compete for or it's it's below par yeah everything that you say it, it shows how linked everything is one thing brings on the other and ultimately it's go only going to be uh, a, a concern for the sport across the board. I mean, you, you touched on it at the start, Sam, about you know where we are now is obviously as a result of of years of, of having your taking your eye off the ball. You know, whether it's the bookmakers, whether it's the industry. I mean, we we kind of know that you know we could have all done it. You know, it could have been done better in mm -hmm. the years leading up to this, and this is what's happened now uh, with regards to affordability. So I, I, I've argued the case that you know. It's affordability checks, obviously tackling problem gambling ultimately, um, and problem gambling is perhaps, I think, looking at problem gambling as the end of where someone's at in their own life. It's it's perhaps not the way to do it. You kind of go, you're going wrap bad it the wrong way. You need to go back and see what's led to problem gambling. It'll be the same as what's led to alcohol alcoholism, what's led to obesity, or whatever whatever the, mm. the vice issue might be. The end, end result isn't the main concern, really. It's how did you end up in that position? What caused you to get there? You know, that's that's the way I would go about, you know, because those are the symptoms of what's wrong with someone. Um, but ultimately, mm -hmm. you say the responsibility for everyone, everyone has to take responsibility for their actions. And unfortunately, I don't think enough people have over the years and we've ended up in this position. But now we've ended up in this position being subjected to affordability checks potentially um, as a consequence of people making decisions who so I don't I don't believe understand gambling no and I and I, and I find that difficult to accept you know that in, in order to understand why you would why you would even consider bringing in affordability checks or not you would have to have some understanding of mm. gambling and mm. and the way it's done it's not simply a case of oh, I just want to throw money away it's not that 
you know, for, for you, for, for me, for the majority of people I know that like to have a bet, it's, it's the, the, the result of a calculation made in your brain with a judgment at the end of it. You know, you, you considered it's not just reckless for the majority of us. And that's the situation that I find what, what I find really difficult to accept that we're now having to accept or potentially accept the ruling and the, the judgment of people who don't really get it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, and I think, you know, whether it's still the case now, but obviously casino playing on m mobile phones and tablets was, was lumped in with the gambling, um, you know, on, on horses or on football or whatever. And, you know, coming from somebody who I would say through 15, 16, 17 years of age, probably had a rather unhealthy obsession with fruit machines. You know, I can see how addictive that they are. You know, and we've all been in betting shops back in the day when the roulette machines were going and people were funneling in thousands and thousands of pounds in a short space of time. And and, and those those are the those are the issues. You know, and racing, unfortunately, now is is paying. I'm not saying there aren't problem gamblers who bet on horses, but racing is paying really for the neglect that was shown to those people back in the day. Um, and that that's that's my major problem now is that. You know, all of a sudden we're playing catch up with this. We're having to be seen to be squeaky clean. Well, you know, I'm afraid gambling isn't squeaky clean. You know, it wasn't till that long ago that bookmakers shops were, were blacked out. You know, you couldn't see in them and you couldn't see out of them. Um, so it was obviously something that was behind the Iron Curtain as such. Um, and it's only in recent times, probably the last couple of decades, etc., that it's actually been OK to have a bet. And um, obviously there's been plenty of advertising and mainstream media. And people have just been encouraged to, to get interested in, and, and have a bet on the football, etc. Now, has that gone a little bit too far? Um, mm -hmm. Are we are we attracting too many young, uh, impressionable people into into betting? You know, I hear stories quite a lot of the time where you know there's there's young lads, the other side of twenty, sometimes the other side of eighteen, who are having a you know twenty pound roll up on the American football because they watch it on a Sunday night, and you know that that strikes me. A little bit unhealthy, albeit coming from somebody who used to bet under A's themselves. So, you know, I think it's a lot more prevalent. And, you know, obviously the, the targeting of, of young people is, is, you know, in all walks of life. And, in you know, certainly in, in with alcohol, with vaping, with, with anything, it, it's that rush to get that young person interested in your product. And whether that's gambling or whatever it might be, whatever recreational uh, activity it might be i think i think that's where there really needs to be more responsibility ensued yeah um echo those sentiments uh sam uh, we can obviously talk about this but there is mm. so much certainty with regards to it as well that we are just sort of uh shooting the breeze about it and more without knowing exactly what's going to happen because at the moment it's it's all it's all a, a, a mess yeah, I think the one the one thing I would say, Rich, is that the Racing Post came in for a fair bit of stick for for not sort of championing this. No, I think they are, you know, they are our trade newspaper paper, and and to some ex extent they they are doing their best to to you know. There's been some excellent articles from the likes of Bill Barber, Lee Mottershead, um, Lewis Porteous. You know, they are doing their best to to try and rally the troops as such. Hopefully, it's not too little too late. Um, and also, you know, a lot of people that I sort of speak to, which are professional punters, you know, they've encouraged people to, you know, to petition their local MP and there's been a bit of that going on, oh, I've done that. And, and you know, I know a lot of people have done that. So hopefully there'll be some common sense, um, you know, and hopefully the government, whether you love them or loathe them, um, will, will make a, a common sense judgment and a practical one. Well, fingers crossed. We Whilst there's life, there's still hope. So let's hope that it doesn't. <laughs> end up with racing heading in the direction that it seems it is inevitably. Now, before we get into our weekend preview, just to let you know that our sponsor, Bet365, have an ITV racing price promise. They'll not be beaten on price on any horse for all UK Irish races uh, shown live on ITV racing. Full T's and C's can be found on the website. Uh, Sam and I are going to look ahead to some of the best racing this weekend, Sam. And uh, I mentioned at the start of the show, the Sprint Cup at Haydock. Um, it looks a great opportunity for the favourite, Shaquille, to add another Group 1 to the Commonwealth Cup and the July Cup. Um, although, 
it's worth mentioning that the stable haven't been in the greatest of forms by that form by their own admission uh, although they did have a winner um, at the back end of last week yeah I think Steve Steve Brown uh, partner of Judy Camacho said that they might have had a bit of a low grade infection um, but there's probably a lot of that going around and, and for a smaller stable with a, a, a more limited number of horses um, it's no great surprise to see them sometimes go two or three weeks without a winner. As you say, they broke that little hoodoo last week. Um, they've got a horse here, which but for Paddington would be the, the story of the season, really. And, and in a lot of respects still is because obviously from smaller connections um, and, and smaller acorns, this big oak tree has grown. And, you know, he's got so many little idiosyncrasies, this horse, that he's become a, a magnificent horse to follow. And we felt... You know, we've, we've sort of grown and enjoyed his journey as, as he's progressed through the season. So um, it, it looks a great opportunity for him. The second favourite, Kim Ross, is probably unlikely to run. Rafe Beckett, who looks like he's going to rely on Lezu. Um, Spy Catcher must also be a little bit of a doubt unless they put significant water on because we're supposed to have a dry week all week. Big temperatures as well. Some big numbers up on the northwest, believe it or not. And... I would think that there's every opportunity that there might be a little bit of uh, precipitation put on by the by the clerk of the course. So, you know, whether Kinross and Spycatcher, who the latter's had sort of back issues and feet issues, they're going to be let loose on rattling quick ground, I don't know. But it won't inconvenience Shaquille. The one thing that might inconvenience him on a flaster, on a fatter, a, fatter, a faster six. Um, Is it because you're looking at me that you said that? <laughs> not in the slightest, Rish. Um I, I think that, you know, if he is slowly away, races can be gone at, at Haydock. We've seen with sort of regional over the five furlongs there, that, that the jump and run merchants there and York and those sort of places, they can be difficult to, to overhaul. But he still looks to possess a very significant class edge. And if they've worked on that stall's exit, and don't forget at Newbury, just what was it three starts ago, he probably gave away about half a length out of stalls. It wasn't anything which was quite marked, um, not such as Ascot or, um, or or last time out at Newmarket. So, you know, if he bounces back to that sort of exiting of the gates, as he did at Newbury, then he should be absolutely fine. And, uh, you know, I think five to four or evens, you know, anything around that price, I, I think it, it's fair enough because I find it difficult to find one that's possibly going to jump out of the ground and, 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 and go past him form-wise. The, the only couple that I thought might be interesting were a couple of Haydock, horses that have managed to win on the Northwest venue before and that sense of duty we don't even know if she's going to line up but she's got, obviously got a very good record fresh she had a bit of a problem after she won at Newcastle and has been off for 440 odd days but if they do pitch her in here I think she's a very interesting contender and regional stretching out to the six from the five whether they go to the, the well again so quickly uh, after that um, creditable run in the Nunthorpe where he was only beaten a couple of lengths just got tightened up late on, which probably cost him half a length. It might have cost him fourth place as well. But he's, you know, he's a horse that's finished third in the Stewards Cup. So I think going out and stretching out to a fast, a fast six from five um, at a course that he loves. I don't know whether they'll roll the dice again, Ed Bethel and his team, but he's sort of twenty to one. He might be of interest each way as well, just to take on the favourite who looks, you know, as I say, a, a worthy even money five to four chance. Yeah, I think you've summed it up beautifully. I, I think he stands out. Um, they have been working on his uh, stall's exit and it seems to have improved at home. If it has improved at home, then forget about it for everybody else. <laughs> uh, the, the, the horses that you mentioned, I mean, regional stepping up to six is interesting considering the way I liked how he finished, even though he got slightly hampered. Up yeah, there. yeah, me too. Um, and sense of duty. I remember when she won at Newcastle, um, speaking to connections afterwards and yeah, they, they felt they had something pretty special on their hands with her mm. and, it's just a shame that we haven't seen her since. But um, if she does turn up, you never know. Uh, I think, given what Kin Ross has got planned for the rest of the season, I'll be surprised that unless mm. the weather forecast is wrong or they leave the, the watering system on in error, um, then I doubt he'll make it because he's got, you know, he's got the champion sprint to Asuka, he's got potentially the Breeders' Cup, and he's got Hong Kong. Uh, all yeah. He wouldn't want to risk all of that. France as well. Will he go to France, France as well? France as well. I mean, he's going to have a busy time of things and you want to push the boat, push the boat out on, on ground that's too quick. OK, that's a look at um, the Spring Cup. Irish Champions Weekend um, at Leopardstown and the Curra. 
the Irish Champion Stakes, one race that has been priced up, that we know it looks as if it's going to be a rematch between the Derby first and second, August Rodan and King of Steel, but King of Steel is a favourite. Uh, possibly Ernesto is going to line up in the race. I think Frankie Vittori is going to be riding him. Mm. Al Riffa, interesting for the Joseph O'Brien team. I thought ran well behind mm. Ace. Um, Luxembourg, the winner of the race last year. How how, how are you going to play this one, Sam? Well, th there's obviously been a um, Ace Impact won't run. Um, neither will Mostadav. So as you say, it looks like a, a head to head between the Derby first and second. I don't know if it's fair to say that um, Augusto Rodin, who's a a dual derby winner has had a pretty underwhelming season really when he's when he's good he's good and when he's bad he's bad but I, I was just thinking if you win two derbies in a year and people are saying you've been a real disappointment God, the bar's gone quite high these days um but obviously the money has all been for king of steel in the last few days he must have worked very well i think he worked the, the day before yesterday yeah um and, and did a sparkling piece of work so i think that's tuned him up nicely um he's a horse that i think the great majority of race goers race watchers love because he's a just great big tank of a thing um got loads of quality and i think it's uh, it's been quite a good story for racing that that roger varian's got a, a true group one horse group one three-year-old um i don't know what to expect from august rodan i'm not sure anybody does um so i'd, I'd have to overlook him i am very respectful of king of steel but I, i'm going to go with last year's second ernesto um i thought it was a really really good run back in in the pre jacques lamar over a mile, um, not beaten too far by Inspiral. I think that's a good level of form. He was on, you know, it was his first run back. He was 25 to one on the Paris Mutuel. Um, and I, I was surprised how well he traveled into the race for as long as he did for a horse that really wants 10. Very good record in small fields. This race might cut up a little bit. I think he's won a couple of six runner races. And also he's beaten in this just half a length last year by Luxembourg. So I think with Frankie on, you know, some six to one about three places still as we we record this i think he's he's probably the the, the cheats way out really the each way bet on ernesto is probably the way i'd go well i was hoping that similarly i'd quite like the same sort of sentiment about uh al riffa who mm. obviously took a while to come back to the track but ran okay on his comeback run um, and then he went to, to France, and I thought he ran a terrific race behind Ace Impact, who's clearly just got more speed than Al Riffa. But that, I don't see that as anything to be embarrassed about. Al, Ace Impact is the favourite for the arc because he's just so good. Um, but I like the way Al Riffa stuck on at the end of that race. And if you remember last season, his best performance came at the Irish Champions weekend when he won the national stakes. It was a very mm. strong performance, and I'm hoping that you know, his progression this season comes to a head here. Um, maybe he can get in the mix with the three-year-olds. I mean, August Rodan, obviously, there's a question mark. Even though Adrian Bryan says he's flying, you're still taking it on trust that, you know, two out of his four runs this season have been complete blowouts. Mm. So that's 50-50. Uh, and King of Steel, obviously, he's very good. But is he is he the, the star, 10 furlong, three-year-old Colt? Mm not sure that he is um you know the the former royal ascot it's okay it's not outstanding um obviously august redan beat him in the in the derby and then in the in the king george a, a fine run behind two older horses who put him mm. comfortably in their play in his place hookham and westover so i don't think he's you know unbeatable and so i'm i'm looking for a new kid on the block and that's al riffa for me <laughs> Yeah, the only thing I, I'd say with, with with King of Steel is that, that you know, there was only three weeks, wasn't there, between Epsom and the King George. Um, and I, I, I wondered, um, you know, whether he might just have bounced, bounced off the back of that. Um, sorry, three weeks be between his King Edward win and the, the Derby. So I wondered whether going to the King George, a race that he wasn't always going to be targeted at, whether that was just... He got rushed into that race a little bit, and I, I don't know whether he was really always 100% a runner in that. They, you know, they were looking to France, weren't they, and all those sort of races. So I thought he got stuck in the mud a bit. I thought it was quite a brutal test as well, the King George. Um, I think it suited the older horses and the three-year-olds. Well, Gus Redan, for one, you know, were, were, pretty, were pretty abysmal, really, in that, um, other than uh, King of Steel, who, who ran a race of great credit. So... I, I am still, I'm, I'm very wary of him. I think he's got a lot of ability, a lot of natural class. I think, you know, a, re, a reasonably run 10 round Leopardstown on fast ground should be ideal as well. 
Um, so yeah, fingers crossed he goes well for connections anyway. Okay. Um, anything else on Irish Champions Weekend that you're? I think there are a number of potentially good horses on show, uh, amongst the two roles, City of Troy. Uh, there's Yalang Yalang who mm. is heading for the Moy Glare. Um, there's the Irish Ledger. Kiprios looks like he's he might be back for that. Um, High Highfield Princess is heading to the Flying Five. Um, the Matron Tahira up against Rogue Millennium. I mean, this it's all in the mix. Got no chance, has she, Tahira? Or Tahira. She's going to bump into Rogue Millennium this weekend. I know. I actually thought Zarinsk wouldn't wouldn't be a bad bet in that. She's got lots of Leopardstown form, front runner. I think if it is off the front at Leopardstown, that far rail or the inside rail is is not a, a bad place to be. Um, by by that stage of the Matron, hopefully we'll have found out and. I thought sort of seven to one for her was was a fair bet against a hero who's never been around Leopardstown. So mm. um, the, the one flying the ointment might be Tarawa, whether whether Dermot well sort of runs her as a bit of a spoiler, and um, that might affect Zarinsk. But um, I've been quite impressed with how Joe Lyons and his team have, have sort of navigated her career so far, Zarinsk, and she's she's sort of been the star player for the yard this year. Um, you know, and that coronation performance of Tahira is, was a bit underwhelming. You know, Remarque has finished second in a Falmouth and fourth in a pre-Rothschild since. The third home was beaten 10 lengths in France and the fourth, Meditate, beat one home in the pre-Jean Pratt. So it's not a great endorsement of her ability. And we've yet to see really the explosive Tahira that we did last year as a two-year-old. So maybe it might be this weekend, but I thought Zorinsk each way in the Matron. The Moyglaire, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to. I'm sh shame there's no Vespertillo in there. Um, I don't know why she, I must have missed the new story about why she's not running. Obviously, Ylang Ylang's five to four. We can all see what she's managed to achieve. Um, I think Porta Fortuna, second in the Phoenix, stretching out in trip could be an interesting contender. But I, I really liked Opera Singer last time um, in that group three. There's been some nice horses that have won that and progressed onto good things. Likes of Magical Lagoon, Cayenne Pepper, um, just wonderful. So I thought that was a good stepping stone. I think she's six to one. And as we know, uh, Bally Doyle and Aidan O'Brien, they're not averse to running a, you know, a strong second string in these races. And I think, you know, the fact that she's was so powerful and so dominant last time in a good speed figure, I think six to one each way for her and the Moy Glare appeals to me. Okay. Uh, I, I'm very excited by seeing City of Troy. <laughs> yeah. Just confirm it. I remember speaking to Ken Peterson when he came in after City of Troy won. Um, and he came in to talk, of, talk to us on Racing Weekly and he was over the moon with what the horse had done. But more so, he was blown away by the reaction of both Aiden and Ryan to what the horse did at Newmarket. Kind mm. of confirmation to what they'd always believed that he might be um, something special, not just a, a top class two year old. He might be something special. So uh, that's exciting. Um, well, that, 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 I, I, sorry. Just, just sorry, we should interrupt him. But, but that duel there with Buquano Fuerte, I mean, that. That is a that's a fantastic race. If that comes off, hopefully they both they both turn up. Um, you know, Bukana Ferte is, is three from three at the cover as well. So it's, it's you know he's certainly a high class two on himself. Um, and and talking to Meg Nichols recently, you know, I think his subsequent work post the Phoenix has been very good as well. So I think you know the one to three, three to one, those two. It, it does in essence look a two runner race, but it's a fabulous race. Yes. Uh, and the Flying Five also looks a, a really good race, Sam. Um, obviously, Highfield Princess looks like she's now heading there. Um, Art Power, Brad Sell. I mean, just the, in itself, it's a terrific clash. Yeah, really interesting. Three three British horses dominating the, the sprint, really, the Group 1 sprint. But um, obviously, Highfield Princess won it last year. She's 6-4 to four to win it again. You could say, well, it's a bit disappointing that she couldn't win the Nunthorpe from the position that she was in. But... I think she just bumped into one that day that was that was on a on an absolute going day and you know it, it is a hard place sometimes york to to try and overhaul the front runners as we touched on earlier on so i forgive her that and the, the handicappers felt that the, the goodwood performance albeit at a le level below this hmm. uh, was right up there with one of her best performances and the way that she moved through that race um suggests that she's in as good a form as ever. So I, I don't think you can write her off here. I, I'd probably back something like Art Power each way, it's certainly if there was four places on offer with some firms. Um, you know, obviously four from four. The Curra wasn't disgraced last time, I didn't think. That was a solid enough run in France. Um, back on his favourite stomping ground, make it Art Power to make it five from five. Lovely. All right, Sam, thank you for that. Um, 
I certainly hope Rogue Malena might get in the place <laughs> and mm. the matron. She's actually mm. quite nicely at home. So uh, I think the ground was totally against her when she ran in France last time out. She just couldn't get any traction late in the race when uh, Danny Tado asked her to go. So I'm hoping that as long as it's decent ground um, in the matron and leopard stand that she'll she'll pick up in the style that she did at, at uh, Royal Ascot. So are you, are you lining up a substantial bet, Rich? No. <laughs> to hear her hovers over that particular project um but great racing to look forward to whether it's at haydock or indeed at kenton um on the weekend and on the in ireland at leopardstown and the curra um sam thank you very much um are you racing this week are you heading either to haydock or the irish champions weekend or anything well, like no that? i'm gonna i'm gonna watch it all on the uh, all on the box i'm actually playing cricket on saturday rich can you believe it or not um for a harry derham 11 versus a dan skelton 11 exciting times well, keep sending the updates. Uh, it, it, it certainly be exciting times for, for the Dan Skelton bowling outfit <laughs> having a go at me. Are you opening the bowling? Are you coming on first change? I, I won't be bowling. Uh, I've been told I'm batting three, so I'll get it over oh. with early. And in the mould of which number three batsman would you be? Richards, Ponting, Lara, Tendulka? Tavare. <laughs> I hope people can remember who Chris Tavare yeah. is. One for, one for, yeah, it's a niche reference. Yeah, well, uh, Sam, it's been, as always, an absolute pleasure to uh, chat to you about everything that we've just done um, last week, uh, York, the affordability checks, and looking ahead to Ireland. Best of luck with everything. Um, thank you all very much for uh, joining us for this episode of Racing Weekly, um, brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. If you like what you've heard or seen, then of course, please leave us a kind review on Apple Podcasts or in the comment section on YouTube. We'll be back next week. Ken Peterson is due to join us. We'll be looking ahead to the St. Ledger, the final classic of the season at Doncaster. But that is it from Sam, uh, myself, and the Racing Weekly team for now. We'll catch up with you again very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>